There have been many invasions. The Nazis rounding up the workers of Poland for slave labor. German bands blaring their way down Norwegian streets. Belgian resistance lying in the dust. England thrown back from the continent. Stormtroopers climbing the Eiffel Tower to raise the swastika high above a captured continent. The Russian people listening to the broadcast which told them that they too were on Hitler's doom list. All these nations knew there was but one hope of survival, counter-invasion. On December 7th, 1941, America knew it too. This day and this beach were the pinpoints of time and land for which Allied leaders had aimed through the long years since Dunkirk, since Pearl Harbor. was on. Our men were in France. They had crossed a few dozen miles of water. They faced hundreds of miles of land between them and Berlin. They faced a campaign, a prolonged and bloody campaign, in which this beachhead was only the first thrust. The point was to make this landing stick, to reinforce these troops again and again, to send our supplies out to them with the steadiness of a heartbeat. Here is where the story of counter-invasion begins. Here in the factories, at the workbenches where the tools are made. The tools with which we fight a people's war. The tools with which we fight a war to kill fascism. The tools for counter-invasion which protect the dignity and the hope of the human race for the rest of time. Here is an American task force. Powerful, proud, mobilized for total victory because each individual in it knows the vital part he plays. On June 6, our fighting men approached their task with complete confidence in themselves and their supplies. The faces of these paratroopers were symbolic of the attitude of each soldier down to the last private who was beginning the perilous journey. He was a free man, superbly trained, brilliantly led, completely informed. He entered battle thoroughly instructed in the operations ahead. He was on his way. He knew where he was going and what he was to do. This too the Allied leaders had planned, knowing that of the millions of factors which make up counter-invasion, none is more important than the morale of the individual soldier. In World War I, as in other wars, the individual soldier knew little of his part in battle beyond his own single task, to advance, withdraw, hold his ground. These at once were his commands and his information. Overlooked was the necessity to inform him in the meaning of any large-scale strategy or tactics. Today, this soldier fights with new weapons. One of them is his knowledge of how and why his war and its battles are fought. This is military briefing. Here are soldiers, sailors, marines, airmen, all being given every detail possible on the overall nature of each operation. Before they hit the beach or take the air or move across the sea, our men know the plan of their mission, the interlocking pattern of their attacks. This is a briefing for you, the American worker. Here on the work front, as on the battle fronts, democracy gives the lie to Hitler and his gang, who consider it weakness to enlighten the individual, strength to enslave him. As in military briefing, where questions and answers flow freely, so there are questions workers would ask in an industrial briefing. How many planes will we need for the invasion? How many ships will we need? How many trucks will we need? How many ball bearings will we need? How many shells? 
How much oil? How many radio tubes? How much hundred octane? How many bandages? How many bulldozers? In war, there are no absolute answers. Where we needed tanks yesterday, we need bulldozers today. Where we need bulldozers today, we need planes tomorrow. Where we need planes tomorrow, we need artillery for another tomorrow. There is no outguessing, no outplanning the fortunes of invasion. The only answer to give to Americans is enough on time. From General George C. Marshall, Chief of Staff of the United States Army. A memorandum for the men and women of American production. The invasion now underway will demand the employment of men and materiel to an extent never before approached in history. Materiel will play a more important part than ever. The production of the tremendous quantities of ships, tanks, planes, and other weapons of war, which our armies must have this summer and fall, depends on your personal, individual effort. The losses in equipment will be tremendous. It will be expended in each bitterly contested mile. Our attacks can continue only so long as an uninterrupted flow of materiel reaches the troops. You have, therefore, a direct part in this prodigious fighting effort. We must trust you to make your contribution to the battle without stint or let up. Signed, George C. Marshall, Chief of Staff. Allied forces know the meaning of the word invasion. Two years ago, British Canadian forces raided Dieppe. This was a bold stroke, aimed to test the very coastline we now try again. And it ended with British and Canadian materiel smashed and scattered. British and Canadian lives spent on the pebbly beach. Many months ago, inspecting the Atlantic Wall, Marshal Rommel said, there will be no evasive action and no withdrawal in my theater of operations. The coast and its deeply echelon fortifications must be defended to the last. defenses did the Nazi soldiers rush? We had no blueprints, but we had more than a rough idea. We had our own ways of finding out. Commando raids and captured prisoners. Reports from secret agents. Hundreds of millions of aerial photographs. The enemy press. Captured German newsreels. Based on that information, here is a typical stretch of invasion land, a target for liberation. Here are some of the defenses of the enemy our soldiers faced when they made their landings. Submarine mines, strung out in the water, controlled to blow up any invasion craft which approach. Land mines, on the beaches, beyond the beaches, Mines everywhere, thousands on thousands, to tear the legs off American men, blast the tracks off American vehicles, all of them covered by machine guns and automatic rifles, hundreds on hundreds of these weapons. On the roads, in the cities, in the fields, the pillboxes, the foxholes, Set at angle so their crossfire must reach and slaughter American men. Whether they're fired in fog or smoke screen, during the day or night. More German infernal machines. In the waters off the shore. Obstacles. Jagged steel and iron spikes and spears designed to rip open landing craft, plunge American men into the boiling sea. On the beach, wire. Millions of yards of barbed wire, hooped, tangled, set to shred the bodies of American soldiers. Tubes releasing torpedoes which shoot out to sea. Along the shore, a huge concrete sea wall. Hidden in recesses, camouflaged, the coastal guns.
In addition to these monsters, the giant railway guns. Incredible, unbelievable. less lethal guns, field artillery, rocket guns, massive mortars, their shells falling with annihilating force. The Nazis make use of every stunt known to military defense. Intricate systems of steep walled canals, infantry stoppers, tank traps, other tank obstacles, roadblocks, ditches, barricades, artificial floods in the lower parts of the land, forcing troops and vehicles to bypass them, only to move under the muzzle of Nazi howitzers and cannon. Back from the beach, a line of bunkers blockhouses, ramparts connected by subterranean tunnels. All these protecting still another bulwark of defense, the fortified towns. The windows are walled up, except for slits which conceal German guns. The approaches and intersections are guarded by artillery, blocked by wire and overturned trolleys. There are no civilians here. They've been evacuated long since. Only Hitler's soldiers walk and wait in the haunted streets. Here is perhaps Hitler's most formidable defense. His men, the creatures of fascism, the pick of his Nazi regiments, the most unyielding of his fanatics. coastal defenses. More major areas and elements of resistance reach back deep into the continent. The enemy's armored divisions, Panzer troops, the giant Tiger tanks. A network of railroad lines and highways over which whole divisions, as many as a dozen, were to be moved to any part of the invasion area overnight. A transportation net indispensable to the Germans but useless to the Allies. For the Nazis can be depended upon to demolish every serviceable installation as they retreat. One more German weapon. What is left of the Luftwaffe? Here, on stretches of land like this, our most desperate battle merely begins. As we reach and break through one line of resistance, we can expect only another, and another, and another. Invasion can never stop. If we fail to press forward relentlessly, the German defenses will turn into German offenses, determined to push us back into the sea. No matter what the cost in equipment, no matter how long the casualty lists, there is no rest in invasion until victory. On D-Day, 
The German coastal defenses were hit by a naval barrage unprecedented in the history of war. The Nazis manning the fortifications and defending the towns were hit by a torrent of bombs, so many and so devastating that the mind cannot conceive their quantity or effect. The German skies were filled with men in white, parachuting down to rip communications, attack airfields and supply lines from the rear. The German railroads, transporting reserves to emergency sectors, were pulverized by vengeance on the wing. great D-Day assault, our troops now have a foothold in Western Europe. To this, America has a four-square answer. Four kinds of power, four kinds of attack. The military might of Germany will be smashed and battered and conquered from the sea, from the air, from the land, and from the production line. To the men and women of American industry whose work produced this air power, General Henry H. Arnold, commanding general of the Army Air Forces, addresses this briefing. The United States Army Air Forces now operating in all parts of the world. Day after day, our 15 air forces strike deep into occupied lands and smash hard blows against our enemies. For the Army Air Forces based in England and Italy, the invasion began months ago. Each day, we send tremendous formations of bombers and fighters over Germany and over France. Each night, the RAF continues the job. equipment essential to the Nazi war machine, whether it is ball bearings, engines, rubber, gasoline, tanks, or guns. We are bombing them in the factories where planes are built. We are knocking them down when they come up to fight us in the sky and strafing and burning their planes on the ground.
At least another thousand returned to English bases badly shot up, requiring extensive repairs. The air battles of last year were very small compared to those going on right now and those that we'll have in the future. Your invasion job is to give us all the replacement of planes and equipment in superior numbers, in overwhelming numbers. We have the plants and the tools and the workers. The Air Force will guarantee that the German worker can build only one or two replacement aircraft for each five shut down. You must guarantee that we get five planes for every five that we lose. That is your job. The equipment for these attacks, the planes, fuel, engines, propellers, instruments, ammunition, bombs, all these from the production lines and high-octane plants and refineries of America. Look at some figures. For a certain number of air attacks on Germany, for a certain length of time. 12,000 men in the plane, 200,000 men in the ground crews, 3,000 tons of bombs, 11,500,000 rounds of large caliber machine gun ammunition, 120,000 rounds of cannon ammunition, 3,336,000 gallons of gasoline, 160,000 gallons of oil. The number of attacks, a dozen? The time, a month? No, one attack, one day. All of this to be hurled at Germany in one round-the-clock, full-scale air invasion. Look at one of the planes used in this attack. Suppose you, the individual worker, were to make one flying fortress all by yourself. It takes 23,743 man-hours to turn out this one plane. Starting now and working on an eight-hour shift, you would put the last part in place eight and a quarter years from now, sometime in 1952. How long will this fortress last? An average of just 21 days in combat. But for everyone which falls, a legion mounts the sky, bringing to German invasion defenses and to Germany herself only the counter-death and counter-destruction she so richly merits. From the sky above to the earth below, counter-invasion. Here at the Army War College in Washington is the man who leads all American men who fight on the ground. The commanding general of the Army ground forces, Lieutenant General Leslie J. McNair, briefs the men and women of war production. The German defenses you have seen are formidable. They may even seem staggering, but make no mistake. The guts, the toughness, and the will to victory of the American soldier, accompanied by the equipment of the American worker, are more than staggering. They are unbeatable. Invasion is going to depend on the men we throw at the enemy and the material we throw at the enemy. And in the last analysis, it is going to be the foot soldier who pushes his way through that maze of defense on the invasion route. We are using great armies of men. They are using a vast amount of equipment provided by the workers back home, the foot soldiers of industry. The men who now deliver the fury of America to the Nazis were trained in England. The ground forces, the foot soldiers, men who once were workers and will be workers again. Harder than Nazi concrete, schooled to kill or be killed. Some of these men have fallen, but for everyone who has, a legion sweeps on carrying the weapons the Germans appreciate so well. Lead. Flame. Thunder. The final answer will be given by American men. 
sea and air operations accompany our attack. But eventually it is the doughboy who springs from the landing craft, cuts his way through the wire, fights hand to hand with the Nazis in their barricaded cities and wipes them out. On D-Day and the days to follow, the American worker also will be there. He will be the backbone of the attack. He will have made the tools and the equipment which the sea will use, the air will use, and in the heart of the struggle, the infantrymen will use. Every time one of these infantrymen went overseas, over 14,000 pounds of equipment went with him. Now that he is on the continent, over 2,000 pounds of equipment a month is needed to keep him fighting. If all work could be estimated in terms of weight, and if you, one worker, turn out a hundred pounds of equipment a day, you are supplying just one soldier for one day. Multiply that soldier by the millions of soldiers we are using in our worldwide invasions. Multiply the weight and the workers, and the product is victory. they go into battle, our fighting men are briefed in the final and humblest of ways. Prayer. Prayer on the airfields. The ships. The earth of many faraway lands. For them, and the workers who pray with them, the words of the Chief of Chaplains of the United States Army, Brigadier General William R. Arnold. Our soldiers are fighting far from home, from their loved ones, and from the churches which they used to attend. But every soldier carries within his heart a faith which, under the guidance of our chaplains, transforms any spot into a place of divine worship. Powerful though our enemies may be, we are more powerful. And we are fighting with weapons which they cannot match. A deep faith, an unbreakable courage, a free man, and the faith and unself-sacrificing toil of all our war workers. And above all, with the help of God. On each hour of D-Day, the invasion planes flew. The invasion fleet sailed. The invasion foot soldiers landed. Great armies of the air, the sea, the land. They carried with them the armies of equipment. Here on the island of England, bursting out of the warehouses, overflowing under the broad fields, the great estates, the racetracks, the roads, everywhere that machines and guns and supplies can be stored, here on the soil of England is the work of America. Here is your role in invasion. Here is your answer to Hitler, and Goering, and Goebbels, and Himmler, and Rommel, and von Poppen, and Ley, and von Keitel, and von Brauchitsch, and Jodl, and Ribbentrop, and Streicher, and Sertorius, and von Stahrenberg, and Kesselring, and von Rundstedt, and Raider, and Heydrich, and Fay, and Strasser, and Bormann, and Tote, and Rosenberg, and Dönitz, and von Kleist, and Quisling, and Laval. Here is the American worker's answer to all tyrants. Here is your role in counter-invasion. Here is your part in history. For all war workers, the words of the commanding general of the Army Service Forces, Lieutenant General Brayon Somerville. The Army is grateful to American industry and to American workers, to transportation and to agriculture for their share in the arming of the nation. 
without united effort, military and civilian, the old cry of too little and too late would still be ringing in our ears. Your effort is a vital factor in the winning of the war. The worker making nuts and bolts must constantly remind himself that these are not mere nuts and bolts, that he in reality is hurling high explosives at the enemy. The clerk must realize that those aren't just papers she's shuffling, that each paper represents a gun in a soldier's hand. Today, we set our sights on future targets. We must set them accurately. In order to find the range, we must measure carefully what it will require of effort, of suffering, of labor, of planning, of sacrifice, and of unity. We dare not lose our sense of urgency, dare not forget that each of us is a cog in a vast machine and that individual failure may lead to failure at some vital point far up the line. Let us not be deluded by the happy thought that the war is won. Bitter fighting lies ahead. We have only dented the rim of Hitler's fortress and touched the outskirts of Tojo's empire. We haven't licked them yet. We dare not slacken our efforts. Rather, we must redouble them. Victory is never cheaply bought. Even victory is only a means to an end. What is that end? What are we fighting for? Why do we bury our sons and brothers in lonely graves far from home? For post-war wages or post-war profits? For bigger and better business? For softer comforts? New ice boxes, radios, cars? You know the answer. Our men are dying to preserve a way of life. The little luxuries are only byproducts. We're fighting for liberty, the most expensive luxury known to man. It's not easily won. It cannot be acquired by half measures or on half time. Dollars will not buy. It cannot be attained without sacrifice. In the year ahead, we will strive for greater accomplishment. We can't win the war on the assembly line or the supply line, but we can lose it there. The men who will win this war are the fighting men, in the air and in the mud. These are the men we serve. They will triumph in the end. It's our sacred duty and our high privilege to serve. No matter what we give, no matter how we labor, we cannot approach their sacrifice. Their valor is a blazing torch to light our way.